How you doing? I'm doing fine. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey man, how are you? Oh yeah, yes. great show. Man. Great. I'm Tom. I'm Tom. I'm Mike. Nice to meet you. Hi Mike. More coach for all folks t-shirts. And we have some Brewer and Shipley snake oil that we will sell you. Snake oil, I think you're the Oh sure. How we got Richard Thompson, Bruce Coburn. Thank you. Huey Lewis, Jeff Amon from Pearl Jam, Guy Clark. David Grisman. Man, the list goes on. Wow. Yeah. So I was going to have you guys sign one here and one here. Sign somebody's flag a while ago, too, that has a lot of signatures on it. I can't do all my, my signature flourishes on that little space, but it's, yeah. it'll work. There you go. My pride and joy. Tom and I, we've had managers and booking agents and uh, publishing companies and the only contract we've ever had between each other is a handshake. Michael and I were both Midwesterners, uh, Midwestern values. Neither one of us were looking for stardom. We were hoping to be able to make a living writing songs. And we liked performing, but uh, our hearts just were not in to Hollywood show business. And it's not like anything we ever planned, you know, it just, just happened. It, when it clicked, it's because we both, we liked each other, we had mutual friends, we were both folk singers, you know, similar uh, uh, histories and playing the folk circuit and so forth. So, don't know, just lucky, I guess. How many times a year do you come back? Oh, I, uh, just when we play Kent. I'm back maybe every two or three years. And that right there, that's the house I grew up in. This is where I'd stand and make sure I was looking cool before I would go out in the evening. And then when I first started uh, playing guitar, I stand in front of this mirror and practice to make sure not only was I playing right, but that I was looking cool. This was really early on. Wow. And so I cannot tell you, uh, I'm looking at the same eyes are just a lot older. I grew up just outside of Cleveland and my dad was a high school basketball, football, baseball, track coach and a world history teacher and absolutely the best storyteller I've ever known. We always sang, Dad sang and Mom both sang in the Methodist Church Choir. While I was not a, a big church goer, I sang with my parents. We would take vacations. When we'd be riding in the car, we would be singing all of those silly old camp songs. And so it was really my father, mother and sister, that really got me into singing. You know, and in fact, that's where I learned to sing harmony. I came from a musical family. My parents were musical. Our mother was a music teacher in the home and uh, she was a bit of a showbiz mom I guess because she was a starlet in Hollywood back in the 40s. In fact she had to decide whether to stay out there and do that or come back to Oklahoma and marry our dad and uh, I sang on the radio when I was four years old. And really I've always been on stage. All of us have been. I have two brothers Keith and Tim and a sister Charlie. Then I got into folk music. My brother Keith started playing guitar before I did. I actually taught him a few chords. I remember him practicing profusely in the back room, his finger picking styles and, and all that. 
This is Alan Tree, the old king of the Moondoggers, and it's time again for another of your favorite rock and roll such as blues and rhythm records for all the gang in the Moondog Kingdom from the Midwest to the East Coast. My young teenage years, we had a disc jockey named Alan Freed. I think it was around 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or something like that. He'd go away from playing Top of the Pops or whatever it was, and he'd start playing rhythm and blues. And so I and thousands of other kids that I didn't know uh, we're doing the same thing, listening to the rhythm and blues. In fact, <laughs> I went to one of the very first rock and roll shows that Alan Freed put on. And I came back, and uh, within a week's time, I had a rock and roll band. I played piano, really bad piano, a drummer, and five saxophone players that were my dad's, you know, played on my dad's basketball team. They all played saxophone. And a doo-wop group. I was the perfect age for original rock and roll, so was Tom. And of course that changed everything. Nobody had ever heard anything like Chuck Berry and Little Richard and Elvis and whatever. And that's when I became a singing drummer at a, in a band in high school. But then folk music really got me. It was like a magical time. There was just something about the music itself and uh, the ambiance of the clubs and meeting people that were just really different minded than most of the people I'd grown up with in, in Oklahoma City. More liberal minded, I suppose. And uh, there was just something about the, the folk thing that really uh, just really got me, and apparently Tom too. The first folk music show uh, over at Oberlin, which was the next town over, and it was Pete Seeger. And there went the neighborhood, you know. <laughs> I'd never heard any of those songs, the folk songs. I was mesmerized, I was hypnotized. They were stories. They were stories like my dad used to tell. That's what got me. And in fact, I've only had two heroes in my life. One was my dad and the other was Pete Seeger. One of my best friends in high school, we were up in his attic and he found a guitar. We traded back and forth, learned how to play that guitar. My sister and I were extremely close, and my senior year in high school, I'd gotten into folk music, and so she and I and her boyfriend formed a folk group doing old Weaver songs and Pete Seeger songs, and we called ourselves the Green Valley Singers. And that was in the summer before I went to uh, Baldwin Wallace College. I was starting to play open mic nights at the coffee houses, and I opened for Josh White, and a lot of the people that came through, and I was one of the house acts there. All of a sudden, I was making money making music. And yes, we did in fact meet right here in Kent, Ohio. Almost 50 years ago, there was a little coffee house called the Blind Owl, about a block over there. Uh, you played the Blind Owl, I assume. Yep, and... Uh... Everybody did. And there, were, there was a whole circuit of folk rooms all across the country. There was a, one called the Lemon Tree in Dayton that we both played. and. Uh, and the most famous one in the state of Ohio, and one of the main rooms on the whole folk circuit was in Cleveland called La Cobb. La Cobb. And Stan Kane, the proprietor, is here tonight. There he is, he's really? right there. Stan, give it up, give it up for Stan. It Stan, that was a long time ago. Michael and I have been <laughs> together 50 years, so that was, you know, uh, right. I was still in, yeah. I was in college, it's, it's funny, because I was getting my education there, but I was doing my apprenticeship uh, at open mic nights at La Cobb. Those were those were fun nights. We did that just about almost. It seems like every night. It probably right. wasn't, but it seems like every night there was just about. Yeah, we had a party. Party, after. people sitting around picking, and that's really what really started folk music. For I think Michael was probably the same thing happened in Oklahoma City. I'm sure. Sure. You know, uh, it was the boot eye for you, wasn't it? The boot eye and the web. Yeah. So I got to be house opening act at the boot eye for everybody from Hoyt Axton to Ian and Sylvia, and they turned me on to other clubs, including Le Cave. That's got me started in the folk circuit. I opened for Ian and Sylvia, and uh, Ian was the one that got me my first jobs in Toronto. I mean, you remember I ended up doing that whole Canadian circuit, and then I come down and do the, the stuff in, in the lower 48. I remember Michael and I, uh, uh, I was playing the lemon tree in Dayton, and you followed me in. I saw your picture on the dressing room wall. First time I ever even laid eyes on you was your picture on the dressing room wall along with a bunch of other folkies. Well, you came in a couple days early and I stayed a couple days late and we hung out and uh, went to the donut shop. Uh -huh. Late at night, remember that? Sure, yeah, I always went to the donut shop. <laughs> Nobody, I don't know of anybody that's really ever 
been able to tell the story. It was really the birth of folk rock. It was it, Pete Seeger and those guys. That was really, you know, Pete and Woody and those guys. That was folk music. But then uh, a bunch of young folks like myself, and Michael and whatever, we got turned on to it. That was the young people's journalism of the time. Civil rights and, and, and the anti-war movement and all that really kind of grew out of folk music. Yeah. It had to happen someplace, right. that coming together, and it happened at the coffee houses, and then it happened after the shows at places like Stan's, you know, a bunch of musicians hanging around, uh, being degenerates and, right. and uh, trading songs, tra and not only trading songs, we were also trading ideas. You remember that? I mean, that was part of it. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd trade ideas about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and oftentimes put it to song, you know, put it to music. And that's really what grew out of it. And uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame owes a lot to LaCave and to Stan Kane here. It truly yes. does. And then uh, I ended up in California, had a partner, Tom Maston, and he and I got a recording contract with Columbia Records. Mike got a contract with A&M Records as a staff songwriter. We went by the name Brewer and Brewer, also known as Chief Waldo and the Potted Mum. Mike would write a song, I would work up a guitar part and a backup harmony, and we would go to these studios late at night into the early morning and record these songs to keep on file at A&M Studios for uh, various people to uh, go through and see if they'd like to record these songs. And uh, to make a long story short, I ended up living around the corner from them. And so we started getting together and, uh, you know, like we had in Dayton. There was a big, huge closet in my room at our house on Fountain Avenue, and they would go in the closet and start writing songs and all this. And it was uh, really neat. I, I would uh, sit between the two guitars and listen to this. I would... Uh, I wish everyone could have that experience to hear Bruce Shipley in, in that type of a mode. We started writing together, doing demos. I think Tom and I are probably the first people to hear Wendy, and uh, and the association were friends, you know. In fact, they they invited me to join the association, and uh, I had to make the decision to either join the association or team up with Tom. And he was getting offers also; he had to decide. And I think both of us decided that. Let's see, we could join a band with 15 members or we could have a partner, you know, so well, duh, uh, we decided. Plus, we liked the music we were making. We were actually two single performers that were uh, singer-songwriters, but we would go down to the Troubadour, which was, you know, kind of the epicenter of, of music, you know, folk music in L.A. We had three or four songs that we'd written together. Well, we'd go down and play them together on open mic nights. And that's really was the evolution of Bruin and Shipley. And all of a sudden here we were, and we had a, a repertoire and no money, but there were some places where we could play. So let's, let's play. We'd go into the studio and cut demos on our songs for them to pitch to other artists. And uh, we did get a few cuts by various people, Glenn Yarbrough and uh, a group called The Poor, and uh, Randy Meisner of the poor went on to be with the Eagles, and the rest of the guys ended up being uh, Rick Nelson's Stone Canyon band. It didn't take long, and A&M realized that we, we kind of had a sound and a style of our own. They said, well, why don't you guys record your song? So we did, and that uh, was our first album, Down in L.A. Our first album, uh, Down in L.A., came out in 1968, and we just maybe two weeks ago learned that uh, it's finally, after all these years, been released on CD, finally. A, a company out of, out of the UK has released down in LA on uh, And this on actually CD. should be good because just about two years ago, we started getting royalties on that album. I'm serious. We're not kidding. We're not kidding. We just... <laughs> I'm sorry? Retirement, Retirement plan. Yeah. There you go. Well, I sure hope I don't have to live on it, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It wasn't like they came up to my door with a Brinks truck or anything. Yeah. And I just got a copy the other day and listened to it, and uh, it's very 60s, but it, uh, it sounds pretty good, if I do say so myself. And it comes with a 12-page pamphlet telling all about the recording of it. Well, it was a pleasure working with the musicians. It was the wrecking crew. We didn't even realize at the time, what do we know? You know, that these are the same guys recording everybody else's hits. We were just going with the, whoever the producer brought in. And Jerry Riopel, who uh, 
finished the LP, he took us up to Leon Russell's home studio, and that's where we finished down in LA. And it turned it into much more of what we had in mind. I was playing my guitar one day in my room, and Mike popped in and says, that really sounds neat, we need to write a song. So Shipley came over and uh, we wrote uh, Love, Love. So, uh, and that ended up on uh, Down in L.A. And uh, really proud of that. We had to find a pipe organ. We really wanted a pipe organ. And there was a, there was a studio that uh, this pipe organ from a church was in. And uh, I'll never forget that. Uh, Le Leon overdubbing the parts to that. And he went through it once and it just sounded great. And he said, let's double it. We said, okay. So he doubled it and then we, then we were really impressed. It was really cool. When we left California, I was literally finished our Down in LA album, living in a tent in Michael's backyard. We had just gotten fed up with living in LA. It was just, it just got crazier and crazier. Michael and I talked a lot about it, and we both decided we wanted out of the whole Hollywood show business scene. It was just not who we were. So as soon as we finished the album, I took off and you know, went to the Hopi Reservation and stayed there. And Michael, his car got in a wreck, and it took him about another month to get out. And we rendezvoused. This is back before cell phones. I have no idea how we managed to hook up, but uh, we, we rendezvoused at uh, a community called Old Arabi on 3rd Mesa on the Hopi Reservation, the oldest continuously inhabited uh, community in North America. I'll never forget Michael been driving across the desert, you know, across the Mojave to get there and his eyes, when I look in all the dust and his eyes looked like somebody put fingernail polish on him and then done that, he looked really bad. That's kind of how we left L.A. I mean, I just escaped. We both have always uh, appreciated the great outdoors, for one thing, and slower-paced lifestyle. We knew we were really shooting craps, you know, leaving, but we figured there just had to be a better way to uh, just live a life, you know, and, and make music and do what we did. And fortunately, it uh, turned out okay. When we left L.A., first of all, we had one gig booked. It was in Tulsa and they canceled on us when we got there because we were hippies and they were afraid their clientele would beat us up. Tom was camped in, in my parents' backyard for a while too and then he was camped out in the woods. You, you went back to Ohio and then I flew in and met you and then we were headed to Wisconsin and your Volvo blew up. Yes. And we had to call his dad my to dad. come and rescue us. Who at that particular point wasn't real thrilled. That his uh, son had become a musician yeah, well, instead yeah. of a marine biologist. Yeah, he didn't. He wasn't, it wasn't that he didn't like what I was doing, he just was afraid I was gonna end up uh, homeless or something like that. You know, you, could, you can't make money making music, somebody from Bedford, Ohio. This right here is the old Vanguard. It used to be a coffee house. And when I say a coffee house, I mean an honest to goodness coffee house back during the old folk days. Michael and I had played this both as singles this room, the Vanguard, uh, when we were traveling back and forth across the country. And we got together in LA and uh, started performing open mic nights together. And then we got an offer from the guy that owned this club to uh, come and play, so we did. We went on to Wisconsin playing schools and traveling by Greyhound bus. And then during that tour is when uh, Dan Moriarty called us and said, you guys, what are you thinking about coming to Kansas City? When we formed Good Karma, I, I, I had been working as a commercial photographer and uh, you know, doing advertising photography. I was not, I was making really good money actually for the Midwest, but I was, you know, I, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And Stanley approached me about forming a, a management company. Dan Moriarty and I were best friends since high school. And after high school, I went to the Art Institute and at that time, we started uh, promoting some shows in Kansas City. They want out of L.A. And, uh, and we could do this. So I decided, yeah, we could do this. It would work out good. And we had Danny there as well. And one night at a uh, 
cookout, I met these two dudes, skinniest guys I've ever seen in my life. I never, and they're standing over the corner like some refugees. <laughs> they told me, that was Brewer and Shipley. <laughs> I wasn't so upset with Los Angeles, but I just wanted to be a little more centrally located because I was touring a lot. And, and they were, you know, kind of upset with the, you know, wanting to get out of there. And we had met Stan Plesser, the owner of the Vanguard Coffee House. And uh, he spun his web and, uh, and talked us into relocating here, the concept would be. There were colleges, we could move around, we could do all kinds of things. And um, uh, we, so we moved here and that was the beginning of Good Karma Productions. At that point, we were out, Bitter End Productions had put us in all these little co colleges and uh, it's, we weren't having a whole lot of fun. And we said, sure, and we went to Kansas City and they had a house and uh, they called it the Good Karma House. Danny Cox lived on the top floor, Mike and Tom lived there and eventually I moved in there for a while as well. A lot of music, you know, music on every floor. It was, so it was a good environment for everybody, like-minded people, and it was really uh, nice. And right across the street was the Vanguard. Good Karma Productions, and uh, no contract, no contracts or anything. All we, all we ever had was a handshake, which ended up, ended up being not such a good deal. Michael and I, that's all we've ever had, and that's been a good deal. But uh, some of the things didn't work out. We had some really talented people there, you know, uh, Dan Moriarty and uh, Gary Peterson, later his brother Paul. Some talented people. It was great while we were there. And we wrote a lot of the songs from Weeds. Well, we were living uh, in outside of Kansas City uh, in a little town called Raytown, just a few acres, and it had a, about a two acre pond. And there were shacks, actually. It, we were thrilled to get it. Well, there are a whole, a whole bunch of pictures of it in our Weeds LP. I mean, I'll never forget when we went out there. Uh, we had to walk into the place the first day. We thought like it was winter time. You couldn't even drive in. Tom's house, I mean, the, the wall didn't even come all the way together. We had to put duct tape up and down the seams of the wall. This little shack that I had, uh, the living room floor was literally held up with a, a jack, a car jack, and bricks. And every now and then when you'd walk through, you know, the, everything would shake, you'd realize, oh, I've got to get under the house and jack it up again. But we were thrilled to have it. It was about time the whole Earth catalog had come out. It was back to the Earth, and that's part of what Brewer and Shipley were about, coming back to the Midwest, back to the farm, back to Happy Acres. It was a back to the land, kind of fed up with city life. Anti-war demonstrators protest U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. I was involved in the Civil Rights Movement. I was involved in the anti-war movement. Do you support President Nixon's latest action in the Vietnam crisis? Well, actually, uh, imposing an American solution to a Vietnamese problem is one thing, and I don't really support that. I can't support that. But taking an action that strong without uh, consulting the Congress which are the elected officials, you know, like the elected representatives of the people, kind of puts Nixon in the position of being a military dictator, doesn't it? Which is what we're trying to fight in Vietnam. When we left L.A., L.A. thought we had quit the business. Good Karma Productions, they booked us in every little college in Iowa and Nebraska and just all throughout the Midwest. We picked the cities, tried to make it routable so that you could drive between the cities without, you know, killing yourself. One of the first gigs we did was in Menominee at the university and we got there late for a sound check even and, and when we got there we we're looking around the only microphone they had on stage was one lapel microphone. Coming so, out of oh, yeah. the speakers on the ceiling. Yeah going down to the public address system that was the PA. Well fortunately there was a rock and roll band there called The Tongue that liked us and we, we liked them and they loaned us their PA for the rest of the gig and then they ended up following us all over the, the state of Wisconsin. Mike and Tom, they drove a lot in the Brewer and Shipley Ford station wagon. 
And, you know, they drove through these terrible conditions in the Midwest and snow and rain and sleet. It was just a nightmare. Being on the road at that time was, it was different. I mean, it was, it was kind of bleak. It was difficult in the South in particular. I was along here at the time. Some places they had no idea what we were or what we were gonna be. Remember in Memphis, this guy, he, he says, as long as you guys aren't smoking muggles. No, sir, we're not smoking muggles. I had no idea what a muggle was. Smoking a joint, I might have, I might have had a clue, but I didn't. no, we don't smoke muggles. That kind of stuff. So there was paranoia about lifestyle and, and some musical content. Cedar River, I think it was called. It was, it was so scary. You know, we wanted out of there so bad. I walked into the, to the men's room at one point, and one of these big guys came and grabbed me by the shirt collar and slammed me up against the towel rack and says, I fought for my country. And I, I thank you, don't hurt me, or something like that. But I mean, it was that close to violence. You know, they hated us that much. I don't want to die in Georgia. Oh, 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 oh. I just want to keep on living on the freedom's hand. Don't want to die in Georgia. Well, we were in Georgia, and it was the early Easy Rider days, and uh, it was kind of the people we were dealing with uh, were, were kind of spooky. That whole feeling of don't want to die in Georgia was also don't want to die in Iowa, don't want to die at the Happy Warrior, you know, so the feelings were coming from a lot of different places. Another person who had come to the vanguard was uh, Nick Gravenitis. Nick had just had a big success with the electric flag, and he was a producer, and he wanted to produce more stuff. Because at that point, we didn't have a rec record contract. You know, we were out of the deal at A&M, and we were looking for a new deal. And so we were making demos. When I first met these guys, I loved them. I thought they were great. The way they harmonize, the way that their songs and stuff, and their, their eagerness. At that time of their lives, they were eager to do something new. And I afforded them an opportunity by my rock and roll connections to get them a deal. Nick decided, yeah, okay, I'll uh, cut three demos on these guys in San Francisco. So we go out to San Francisco to record these, these three demos. Uh, and the band, essentially, it was uh, the Butterfield Blues Band, the same band, a lot of them that were on Dylan's first electric album. Uh, Nicky Hopkins, the Rolling Stones piano player, who was doing studio work so he could keep a green card. And here are all these heavy duty rhythm and blues guys. There were a couple of folkies from the Midwest. So we did have to come up with some musical compromises and uh, great, great musicians. And we ended up, uh, the, al or the, the deal was made that fast. Uh, they were really good demos. I mean, they were, ended up being the songs on the album. And this is, this is it, man. This thing rocks. And if you hear it today, uh, especially after my remastering. Let's see. Yeah. But I, you know, this is the original. This is our original package. At Wally Heyer Studio. Yeah, yeah. And we did this in Studio A. We were one of the first, maybe the first or second act to use it. It just leaps off the tape, man. It's outstanding. It's some really good playing and the singing. I remember, I remember you saying when you we were doing an uh, either a double uh, with Mike and Tom just singing to their live vocals, right? And we doubled. And you said that Mike and Tom are a producer's dream. Would yeah. you still say that today? Yeah. At that, you know, everything is in context. At the time, you know, and when it was happening, you had, you had to get contextual there. 
It was in that period of time, and uh, everybody was vibrating. Well, That's, but but I mean, I mean, Mike and Tom were especially well rehearsed. I mean, you well, know, they listen, were they were ready to go when the when the players were. No, it was the chops. It was the chops. The musicianship. No, the voice. That's what I tried to do was get the right people for the job. Because what do I know about recording, equipment, what microphone to use? I'm a blues guy. One of my heroes was John Lee Hooker. He played in one chord. I mean, come on. I knew nothing about electronics. I still don't to this day. The best is less is more. And but that's what we had to work with is less is more. I had him. <laughs> and that was the difference. I had someone who knew what he was doing. Goddamn, what we call a professional work for you. I was never Did sure his you job were for you. So this is good to hear. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. And then we go back and we play Greenwich Village, The Bitter End, and places like that. And it started, started to build actually an underground following. And the whole time we were on the road, we were writing and uh, writing about what was happening to us. And what was happening to us was happening to everybody else our age. I mean, this was a whole generation in motion. You guys like hearing stories about how the songs came? Okay. Well, we were playing a little coffee house in Kansas City, Missouri, called The Vanguard. We played there lots of times, and uh, we were working on our Tarkio album at the time. <clears throat> Thank you. And we were also, you know, going to San Francisco and recording, and then we were traveling around doing shows. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, we were playing the Vanguard, and one night before uh, going on for the last set of the evening, we stepped out back for, uh, would, uh, would you call it fresh air? Yeah, we, yeah. you guys yeah, ever done that? You know, go out behind the bar <coughs> or go out to your car for a little break? Yeah, yeah. we were doing well, that. Well, that's what we did. We came back in, and Tom said something that just cracked me up. He says, man, I'm really one toke over the line. And I just laughed. I was, so, Started putting it to music, you know, and the next day we got together and in about an hour we turned it into a song, literally just entertaining ourselves, you know, we weren't even taking it seriously. And then the first time we played Carnegie Hall, we opened for Melanie. Remember her, don't you? Yeah. Didn't like, she have a brand new pair of roller skates like or something at the time? It seems like. Her boyfriend had a key or something. <laughs> yeah, like or that. something like that. Anyway, uh, we went over really well. We got a couple of encores and, and basically ran out of songs. So we said, well, let's do that new song. And uh, so we did. And everybody really liked it. And uh, the president of the record company came backstage and he says, oh, you got to record that and add it to the LP, which kind of surprised us because, like I said, we, it was just a joke song to us. And we always consider ourselves ballad artists, you know, and folkies or whatever. So we did, and we turned it in, and then we took a break and went down to the Florida Keys to do a little fishing. And we came back to discover that they not only had released it as a single and it was shooting up the charts, but we were in really big trouble. In fact, trouble with the government. It was the Nixon administration and Vice President Spiro T. Agnew Ooh. named us, Tom and me, named us personally on national TV one night as subversives to American youth. Yes. 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 We made Nixon's enemies <coughs> list. We sure as hell did. We did. <coughs> we were a couple of scary, dangerous guys. Yeah, we were. We made Nixon's enemies list and held it as a badge of honor and still do still to do. this very day, as a matter of fact. Well, to make matters even more bizarre than that, and thanks to you folks, you know, for, you know, they went ahead and played it anyway, saying, screw you, you know, went ahead and played it. And thanks to folks like you, it, uh, it still got airplay. And, Oddly enough, it's, you know, just still getting airplay around the world. It's in movies and stuff, so it's too funny. But anyway, uh, Tom and I were in London at the time, so we didn't get to see it, but it was performed by Lawrence Welk on the Lawrence Welk show. <laughs> Swear to God. Don't you know that we're a sitting downtown in a railway station? One toke, one toke over the line. Spiritual by Gail and Dale. It's gospel to us, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and then, and then, what happened after that, Tom? Well, actually, uh, within just, <coughs> I think it was just like a year or less later than Lawrence Welk doing it, the Grateful Dead starts doing the song. <laughs> so 
think about it. Michael and I are the only guys <coughs> on the, in the universe that ever wrote a song that was performed both by Lawrence Welk and Jerry Garcia. Go figure, you right. know. So we always like to dedicate this to Jerry because he played on the B side. Working with Brewer and Shipley on one toke over the line gave you a charge because they delivered. Do you want another hit song, boys? Here it is. I remember I, I didn't exactly know how to classify it, and I, I asked Nick, I said, what kind of music is this? He said, it's soulful music, and that was accurate. The piano parts I played, I mean, nothing was written down. We got the songs in advance, and the, the band rehearsed everything in advance. And then we came into the studio, and we played basically live with, uh, with Mike and Tom. And it was very nice to work with them, because they're very nice people. I don't think that they necessarily had much input into what the specific parts were. They had their own parts to think about. And, you know, we had to fit with what they were doing. And their guitar parts are full and beautifully synchronized. It's a double-sided coin. It sure is. Uh, we, we wrote a, and recorded uh, what's become a classic, and uh, a lot of people, I mean, the phrase is a classic. Some people will say to me now, young people, that was a song? You know, they've heard the, they've heard the phrase. It's part of the vernacular. And, uh, but it also pigeonholed us. You yeah. Know? It, like it, I said, we, were, we didn't take it seriously. We wrote it to make our friends laugh, you know, and it's pretty different from every other Brewer and Shipley song on all of our albums. So it was great to have a hit, especially such an iconic one after all these years, but it also pigeonholed us. We're album artists, you know, we have never released anything. We've never just recorded a bunch of songs. You know, every album we've ever done, every song meant something. The placement even meant something. Like I was saying, the B-side to Weeds, you know, it's pretty much a medley. That's what I was going to say about, about the sequencing of songs and the album cover, you know, and it was more than just a bunch of songs. It was a whole story inside and out. You know, you could put it put it on and then read the credits and back in those days it opened up and you could put all kinds of stuff in there. And I think uh, that's one of the reasons uh, so many fans felt so close to the artists, personally close. We were a common, you know, a common thread for them. To me, the Weeds album and the Tarkio album were all part of the same body of work. They got cut into two albums by the record company. But that was, that was a magic time. That's a heavy duty rhythm and blues guys. The studio that we recorded at, everybody recorded there. Just kind of a stable of musicians in there daily and nightly. And uh, so yeah, you'd wander from studio to studio, see what people were up to. And for a couple of old folkies, We've actually, believe it or not, been part of uh, cutting edge technology <laughs> from time to time. We were working on our Weeds LP, which was eight track. This is high tech as it got at the time. The first 16 track machine to come to San Francisco, we finished our Weeds LP on. And it was like everybody, wow, 16 tracks. What are we gonna do with all of them? And uh, then we had to transfer eight track to 16 track. And then when it came time to mix, it was everybody hands on flipping switches and flipping dials and everything. We had a song, Oh Mommy, I Ain't No Kami, which is the, the B side to one toke over the line. And Jerry Garcia was just starting to play pedal steel. And uh, we said, Hey, Jerry, we got a song we want pedal steel on. You want to play? Sure. So he, you know, pulled it in and did it. Good all of it. 
We've done it in real time. I mean, we recorded live vocals in the room and had leakage in some cases, um, and they would double the vocals maybe. And eventually we got into a thing where the next record, I worked on Shake Off the Demon a little bit. We actually moved Mike and Tom into the control room, put the band on the other side of the glass, used the control room as a, a booth, and everybody wore headphones, even me. And that helped clean up the acoustic sound a little bit better. The dynamic can really only properly be done by everybody playing together. And this was another fine example of, of how we did things. It wasn't the tubes, it wasn't the transistors. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it was the, the setting and, and, and uh, the, the camaraderie, the musical connection between the players beyond the equipment. The albums from, then, from that point on uh, were out. They, they had to be done every year we needed a, a new album so we were essentially writing for a new album yeah we we're but, having to force ourselves to to write instead of it you know, coming and, naturally weeds and tarkio we uh, we were writing on the road and we were performing them so by the time we actually got in the studio to record them you know we knew the songs yeah well know? like nick gravinata said you know his job we were a piece of cake we had our stuff together his job was putting the band together to augment which, what we were doing. Which he did grumpily. Is <laughs> yeah. that a word? <laughs> Between the two of us, we recorded for four or five major labels, and they've never referred to it as music. It's a, a product. We were thinking, okay, they want product, we'll give them product. We looked up to see what, when that album came out, you know, on the edge of an old LP, there's always those numbers. That's the product manufacturing serial number for that, that piece of work. Well, we found out what ours was going to be, and that ST11261 is what that was going to be. So we told, you know, Capital wants uh, product, we'll give them product. So we named our LP ST11261. I had gone, unbeknownst for me, from being an artist to being a commodity. And I was no longer, I ne no longer thought of myself as an artist. I thought of myself as a commodity. That's what it was. We were just commodities to perform. And if you listen to uh, the album after uh, Tarkia that one took over the line was on, was called Shake Off the Demon. And if you listen to the, uh, a lot of the songs on our latter albums, there's songs about being burned out on the road. This is actually at A and M. A&M Records, they were bored. I think they were either, you know, they were doing some like mixing and it wasn't a major mix room. It was one of like the smaller, tiny, cramped side mix rooms at A&M. Tom is just actually being serious, but Michael is just out there. They're bored, they want to get out and play or they want to go on the road or they want to go home. Probably they're in LA and they hate it. So many artists, you know, you have a success, a hit, and they go, oh, good, I can put my feet up. Well, you can't. That's the time when you really put your foot on the accelerator. <laughs> I think Mike and Tom did that. I mean, they, they had worked so hard. And they were just fried. It's a time to work even harder to, you know, to charge up your batteries and just go for it. And they just had enough of it, you know. And so they, you know, they, they took their, their foot off of the accelerator to a certain extent. One toe kit, I had had some money. All of a sudden, I, had, I almost had too much money. I didn't know what to do with it. It had been on the road forever anyway, because that was the only way we could earn a living, was performing. And then one toke happened, and we just continued to be on the road. We just played larger venues and paid more, you know, per, per show. Living on the road will take its toll on you. You know, after a while, we were getting crazy, because I, I think we were home maybe two months out of one year in 1971 or 72, and that was just a few days at a time added up to two months. One show is just, you can't tell them apart anymore, you know, the venues and the motels and, and whatever. So a lot, of that, a lot of the magic was gone. I didn't break up with Michael, I just told him I couldn't do the road anymore. Kind of wound down, we did, you know, the last few days, I sure didn't want to leave Michael hanging or anything, giving him a chance to get, as Michael, arguably one of the best singers, probably the best singer I've ever known. Uh, so there's no problem with, I knew he could he continue on. I fell in love with Jan Hefkin. 
and I knew that I couldn't continue the life I was leaving. And I was not having fun uh, just being on an airplane every night. Several years, they left on a tour. We call it the tax tour because that's how we paid the April taxes. <laughs> We'd have the Easter egg hunt, and then poor old dad would take off, and it was me, the boys, and oftentimes grandma, Tom's mom, to fend for ourselves for a while. Tom and I took a break in 1980 for a few years, and uh, I was doing some solo things. I was playing a bar up in Nederland, Colorado, and uh, Dan Fogelberg came in, because he lived not far from there, and Caribou Ranch Studios were just up the mountain from there. He was a big fan of Brew and Shipley when he was in college. He sat around you know, in a garage band playing our Weeds album, and he said he had a song that reminded him of Brew and Shipley. It was a three-quarter time song called The Reach, about uh, lobster fishing in Maine, because he had a, a little cabin in Maine someplace. Uh, so he invited me to sing a duet with him on it, which I was honored to do. It was a beautiful song. One thing led to another, and he, he uh, was getting ready to do probably his biggest tour, first time he had ever had a really big band. And he was trying to decide whether he wanted me to be in the band with him for the tour or to produce an LP on me. And he decided he wanted to produce me, so I'd work for me. So uh, I recorded an LP for Warner Brothers called Beauty Lies. It sounds like a Lost Fogelberg album because he's playing lead guitar, it's all the same musicians on his his records and stuff. He's singing with me on a couple of tunes. Linda Ronstadt came in and J.D. Souther sang on a song, so I'm really proud of it. But it was one of the very last LPs released. Mine and, and some Joe Walsh LP. And the only reason those were ever even released was because of Irving Azoff. And uh, anyway, this is when MTV was happening and, and hundreds and hundreds of adult-oriented rock stations that played Jimmy Buffett, Eagles, Fogelberg, whatever, um, stopped playing that kind of music. And in fact, the logos became, we are now playing what you see on MTV. So, for that kind of music. I didn't really know what I was going to do. I've always liked adventure. I've always liked fishing. And when I moved to Missouri, I uh, came down to the Ozarks and uh, discovered Current River. And that it was uh, not just uh, a trout stream, but a trophy trout stream. Zachary's weight is immense, up to half a ton. When I was like, young, uh, you know, going to the movies on Saturday afternoon, and they'd play several short subjects, and one of them was uh, Frank Buck bringing them back alive, and he would go catch critters that you never had heard of before and go places you'd never heard of before. And then there was a couple, Martin and Osa Johnson, places I'd never heard of before. It just carried me away. I wanted to be them. You know, I wanted to be Martin Johnson. Osa Johnson was a very pretty lady, and uh, I think I wanted to have sex with her, but at that particular point in my life, I didn't know what sex was. She had that Amelia Earhart kind of thing going for her. People and places that, I, that were new to me it was an adventure, a discovery. I was doing a documentary, and I found this old guy named Ralph Brown, lived in a treehouse down in the Ozarks. And while I was shooting it, I wrote the theme music, and I got with Michael. I said, Michael, let's, let's record this song. Treehouse Brown, Ed one Lou Trey, Little Kenny Payne, and the Harbor Clan. Times were hard living in the country, trying to build a life out of rock hard land. I'm actually a professional member now of an organization called Engineers Without Borders. And they take young engineering students and put them into the third world. I've been to the Andes, I've been, I've been in some wonderful places with them. I feel really blessed to have been able to 
to do that, to live out some of my dreams. Uh, but it just cracks me up that I didn't know at the time that I was, that I was doing it. We both love the Ozark Mountains in Southern Missouri. And for me, it goes back to my childhood. We came, my family came here on vacation and went to Merrimack Caverns and Onondaga Cave. And being from Oklahoma, any body of water I ever saw was just red, muddy water. And I was just blown away by the crystal clear spring-fed streams and the history with you know Jesse James and just all that stuff. So I'd always been really attracted to the Ozarks and, and so had Tom been. A friend was taking me to see a boat, and Michael was a friend of his. That's the day, the day we met, was going to look at this terrible boat <laughs> that sank while we were on it. And I invited Michael, come on up for cocktails and a sunset. And he did that evening, and he's been here every day since, unless he's been gone. <laughs> when I walked onto the property, the beam just went into my brain and said, you're home. It's like I was given the responsibility of taking care of the place so other people could come here and be a part of it and could heal from, you know, different things. And that's pretty much what it's been. And we just have good vibes from everyone that comes. And if they're not good vibes, they never come back again. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Larry Eastep from the Central Illinois Weather Network with another update on the severe weather situation in southwestern Missouri. A new tornado warning just issued for Stone and Taney counties in southwestern Missouri. This tornado warning will be in effect until 1.45 this morning. The last day of February, uh, my lovely lady Scarlett and I had our home blown away by a tornado and everything, everything we own. So life as we knew it has seriously been altered and in ways that you can't even really put into words. About 1.30 uh, in the morning, she was awakened by extreme lightning, thank God, and got up to turn off the computer, turn on the TV, just in time to hear him say, take cover now. And she ran down and shook me and uh, said, we have to take cover right this second. And she headed for the bathroom in our bedroom, and something hit her in the back and knocked her to her knees. I got out of bed and didn't make it six feet when the ceiling caved in on me as the roof went flying and glass flying and walls disintegrating and, and we just held each other in the door well of our bathroom, literally uh, trying to keep from getting sucked out and uh, looking at open sky as we watched and listened to our home disintegrate around our ears. And we're just very, very happy to still be here, uh, but we're a little tweaked at the moment. We're a little little uh, crazy people. And two, three days before the tornado, I had taken my guitar out of its case and put it on a stand in front of the fireplace where the fireplace used to be in where the living room used to be. And uh, it was completely buried in the biggest, biggest pile of debris there was. And about three days into it, uh, we were going through, you know, the rubble and finding a, a photograph here, you know, something something, any, anything here and there. And I was in a back room going through stuff and Scarlett came in and she says, look what they found. My guitar. Buried under the biggest pile of debris out of the case. Well, it was full of glass. It was covered with glass. Everything, all the electronics were rattling around in it. Uh, I took it to my guitar guy. I got it back last night. So... <clears throat> It's got, uh, kind of like me, it's, it's got a few dings in it, but uh, it's still, uh, I didn't know until sound check that the damn thing still plays. Isn't that just amazing? What is that? Some kind of miracle is what they were. Come on, I'll show you the okay. new place. Coming right along, and that's why we live here. Look at all the debris down the wood still. We took a direct hit. It's like Tom's documentary, Treehouse. I got a crippled arm, but I'm still here. <laughs> yep, the sun sets right there every day. Here, I'll show you where we were. Right there is where I've written a lot of songs. And then what we know is the sun room. You saw that video of the bedroom, this is where the bed was. That's the door well we huddled in 
sun heat and being sucked out while everything disintegrated around us. They lifted the grill over up the off the deck over the railing and didn't take out the railing. That's wind force. Strong, <laughs> That's pretty powerful. strong wind. Yeah, we dodged a lot of them in our youth, didn't we? But it never got us. Yeah, they had come to Missouri, from Oklahoma City, to get in a tornado. That's kind of weird. Somewhere down the line, we'll have a house again. Yeah, I can't wait to be sitting on this deck again. Going around the sun one more time. As the sun goes down in the Gulf of Mexico, the ocean's dying, an evil wind blows. The sea turns black as it's shaken by the thunder of mankind's greed. And corporation plunder, they're lining up disasters, putting them in a row as the sun goes down in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, folk music has always traditionally been about a lot of it about social commentary. My Retro Man CD, basically almost every song on there was inspired by the Bush administration. <laughs> and in fact, it comes with a warning on the back. It says, this CD contains material defending the Bill of Rights and the Constitution of the United States and may lead to independent thinking. So uh, I, anyway, just have no choice. It's just every now and then I have to write a rant. My parents went to a church in Oklahoma City where I, where I was born and raised. When it was a tent, there was, when they were building the church, they were there from the ground floor up. And uh, my two brothers and sister and I were raised in that church. And uh, gosh, I was baptized in that church. We went to Sunday school. My mom was the organist. My dad was in the choir. My mother sang solos. When I was a little kid, sometimes she and I would sing duets. We were involved in the church. Well, one day in the 50s, a black family came to worship and the elders of the church, my grandfather included, stood on the church steps and uh, wouldn't let them in. So my parents were outraged and they grabbed us kids up and left and we never looked back. And to this day I have the utmost admiration and respect for my parents for doing what they knew was the right thing to do. And it wasn't an easy thing to do in 1950, whatever it was, because it created quite a row among uh, our immediate family members for, for some time. But, and I also thank them to this day for setting that kind of example for me. I always have been a, like to draw and everything. If I went to my 50th high school reunion a few years ago and some guy I hadn't seen since high school and we weren't even necessarily friends in high school, but he says, uh, so what did you end up doing? He didn't have a clue about Bruin Shipley. And I says, yeah, I got into music. <clears throat> and I was making music in high school too, but anyway. He says, I always thought you'd end up being an artist because you always like to draw so much. But uh, my dad was an artist. Uh, I have a great, great uncle who's quite a famous painter, actually. In fact, uh, my, my last solo CD, my brother Keith and I wrote a song about him called Uncle Samuel's Fiddle. And uh, we have his fiddle. In fact, his 150-year-old fiddle being played on the, the song we wrote about him. So art illustrations, painting, whatever, you know, that my oldest daughter is a very talented painter and, and art teacher. She's definitely an artist. So that just kind of just part of the gene pool. It's not what I do, it's literally who I am. You know, I came from a musical family. I sang on the radio at four years old. I've always been on stage. And uh, then writing, it happens. Well, I least expect it. A lot of times I don't even know what the songs are going to be. It's kind of like I have a radio going in my head all the time and every now and then I turn up the volume. Pay attention to it. You want to hear that song? Yeah. Well, of course, the slogan's uh, hands up, don't shoot. I figured that sounded like a song to begin with. <clears throat> Accustomed to the atrocities on the world news every night. 
Pictures of our wars and foreign lands, our endless plight. Now we're seeing things we've seen before and hope we never see again. Trouble down the Mississippi in a town called Ferguson. They're calling for truth and justice, but they haven't found them yet. The citizens and the system apparently have never met. The uniforms do whatever they please and we're just on our own. So we're marching in the streets again, right here at home. Hands up, don't shoot, hands up. Hands up, don't shoot, hands up. The truth is out there somewhere, along with justice held at bay. Troubles in our own backyard, in the good old USA. Hands up, don't shoot, hands up. Hands up, don't shoot, hands up, hands up, don't shoot, hands up, hands up, don't shoot, hands up. You weren't even born when we. That is, that is, a, that is true. You true guys statement. were just <laughs> out there in the ether someplace <laughs> when we were when we were writing those songs. So I'm really glad you like them. I know when you guys were talking about all the old people, we felt like, hello, we're here. Yeah, well, it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting uh, to see who our fans are. We find more and more all the time young people coming to our shows and teenagers even yeah. And they'll come with a stack of Brew and Shipley LPs, where they even found them, I don't know. I mean, in good shape. A lot of people, you know, will tell us that they grew up listening to us because of their parents, you know, and now grandparents. But I, I don't know how they've gotten turned on to our music. They're knowledgeable of our music, too. It's not just one toke over the line or something, you know. Some of the more obscure songs on our LPs they'll comment on. It was my son-in-law uh, came to our show in Steelville, Missouri, at Wildwood Springs Lodge. And he said he'd never been in an audience of people that old and uh, didn't even know what it was going to be like or anything. And he says the minute we started playing, he saw 20 years go off everybody's face. They've remained true to their generation. They've remained true to their audience. And they've, re they've remained true to the ideals that we had and we still have about this country and, and, and where we're going. And that's what they mean to me. I'm happy going out now seeing... Uh, for the folks that have kept us, you know, supported us all our lives, you know, the people that bought weeds and bought Tarkio and came to our concerts. And that's why Michael and I both have a real, uh, we feel really responsible to our fans to provide, you know, a good show for them. That's why uh, we don't buy cheap t-shirts, you know, to sell them. Uh, they've been supporting us, so uh, we probably make about three or four dollars less on a t-shirt but I still see our original t-shirts people people wearing them and they're not all ready and coming apart so we our fans have been a big part of who we are well we hear it every show you know people say uh, you know to, man I was right back in college you know hearing those songs you know how music is a song will take you to a time and a place just like that and music really is a powerful magical Magical, truly a magical thing. And I remember talking to people, talking about back in 68, for instance, when we, we left LA, we were playing the Heartland. There were so many people all over the Heartland who uh, said they felt like they were all alone until they heard Down in LA or Weeds or Tarkio and a lot of our songs, you know, social commentary. And they said that uh, made them realize, gosh, I'm not alone after all. It gave them hope. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Yorma Kalkinen. Welcome to Life in the Fur Peace Ranch. Mike Brewer and Tom Shipley have been around for a long time. I met Mike in the very early 60s. The well of folkies is deep indeed, and I was one of them on a lesser known scale. The boys have never had to get back together because they were never really apart. They've been lifelong musical friends and play together whenever the spirit moves them. Brewer and Shifley. Work, work, work. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to yak for a while, you'll see. I was figuring his intro would probably go on. It could go. It's, it could go. So that's all you have to do when, you're, when your money drops are, is just go out. So that's it. Just, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. With the airplane after, after, the, after the shooting up there. And of course, Cantor incited a riot. And I know we got tear gas, all the stuff. I mean, yes, anyway. The bright lights, the glamour. Now that we're geezers, uh, you know, I have to say more, more times than not looking out at our audience, it's looking more like the Lawrence Welk audience all the time. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <clears throat> It just is, you know. Well, singing, singing that one choke all over the country, Michael and I have really been blessed. You know, we got an opportunity to play. We played every state in the Union, travel all over the country. And uh, one of the things that we, we like so much about it is you go to different parts of the country and there's people from different parts of the world. You know, you go down, you go down to Florida and there's people, you know, from the Caribbean and whatever, all over the place. You go up to the Northwest and there's people from Asia and whatever. There's, this country's made up of folks from all over the world. <laughs> My uh, ancestors literally came over on the Mayflower. So I'm a relative of those first uh, wave of boat people that came over here. <laughs> and trying to get here is what, you know, for everybody, including my ancestors, was really tough, you know. But once they got here, once you got here, trying to make it as an American was really hard. <clears throat> and as you can probably tell just watching the TV today, immigration seems to be a big thing. So. Michael and I uh, like people from all over the world, and we really like people from this country or that are living in this country. So we wrote a song about it, and it's called uh, Streets of America. We came on the Santa Maria, and we come on the Sloop John B. We keep coming cause we heard there was a place we could be free. From the shores of many nations, we're blown here by the wind, sweet lady of the harbor. Won't you kindly let us in? I know why 
We have gotten, in other places of the country, we've started to get uh, some flack for that song. And it's too bad. Uh, there was this guy that said, a house divided against itself uh, will not stand, and it was Lincoln. And we kind of got to that point, and I feel it, Michael and I feel it, when we're up there on stage, and then, you know, it's, it's like, well, Michael and I are up there on stage, and we're speaking to an audience, giving them our point of view. And now, it's not that they just disagree, they're pissed. They don't want to hear it, they're out of there, even if they were fans of Brewer and Shipley. You know, even if they loved our music. Now, uh, a political view that doesn't hold with theirs, no longer makes it. They stormed out. Fans stormed out because uh, we said that people, people come here from all over the world and we think that's good. People are always telling us, you guys sound as good as you ever did. Well, we know we don't, but we can't hit the high notes. You know, we like to say on stage, you know, people, we've had some, written so many songs and recorded so many at this point, we would perform them and then time would pass. You know, we're working on a new LP, new songs, so the songs on stage would be replaced by new songs. And, we, and to quote Joe Walsh, just because you wrote them don't mean you can play them, you know, if you're not doing it all the time. Plus, we would have to transpose a bunch of them because they were, we can't hit the high notes like we used to. I like to say on stage, you know, I thank people for, for all of their requests for the songs they'd like to hear. But uh, a lot of the songs we wrote were too high when we wrote them, but then so were we. <laughs> Do you see yourselves ever making another CD together? Probably not. Probably not. And it's, it's probably, it's time and distance as much as anything. When, uh, when we were on the road together, uh, and we were on the road all the time, it was a piece of cake, I and mean, we were essentially living together. It was not difficult to do. But now, you know, Michael's got a, a life, and uh, I've got a life, and to do an album, to really do a good album, is first of all, you gotta write the songs. And that, the good ones usually take quite a while to, to really write, and in fact, I've got one recording uh, that's uh, semi-done, it's got two vocals on it. My armorial moon Hanging with the Southern Cross Peeking round the mountain tops Its magic smiling through Swimming through the stars Dancing in your eyes They I was in the Andes, and I was the first, first night up there about 14,000 feet, and I looked, and there was uh, a full moon between the peaks, and to the lower right uh, was the Southern Cross. So I was in an Aymara community, and so that always, a full moon is an Aymara moon to me. And uh, I came up with this little melody, uh, my Aymara moon hanging the Southern Cross, I sang it, uh, sang it to Michael, and uh, it became a song. The song was a love song, but it was really spawned by an, being an entirely different discipline. Our voices now were singing in the same range, you know, and uh, that makes it doubly diff uh, difficult. Trying to, uh, you know, Michael used to sing really, really high, so it was easy for me to find, you know, a harmony below him a lot. And uh, I've gone from a tenor to a baritone in my old age. You work with some really great people. Oh yeah, but, and there, there's a big but, uh, at the same time, that's what took us out of what we did best, was being an acoustic duo. 
So I have mixed emotions. I love, you know, I love playing with those guys. That was great from a personal standpoint, making music. But in terms of our career, uh, you know, it was probably not one of my favorite things. But actually, uh, I'm, not, I'm not complaining about anything that didn't bring me right to this spot right here, right now. Well, I make the joke a lot that, that we want to be the last hippie standing. And the sad part is that so many of my dear friends are in the ground. And uh, with show business that uh, drove them there. And uh, unfortunately, most of it uh, had to do with drugs. You know, and now I'm one of the one toke boys, you know, and, and an official mem member of normal, but uh, that wasn't what they were doing. They just kept getting more and more involved in it, and uh, so many of my friends died. That's that is really sad. It's a very sad thing. Uh, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. That wasn't Michael. There was a period uh, after one toke when it could have gone south, did go south a few times, but uh, we both had enough sense to you know, pull it back and, and, uh, and I think living in the Midwest at that particular point kept us from falling into the trap that so many of our friends, dear friends, uh, took and ended up in the ground because of it. Michael and I at one point were counting up uh, all the guitar players that played on our albums and uh, they're all gone. Same disease, and uh, it's really sad, but that was rock and roll also. I told him we were, I was coming, and he came down, he and a few folks came down the last time we played Kent, and uh, I called, the, got a hold of the club, make sure we could get some folks in. So Mark said, oh, well, I'm gonna come in early, he said, well, he said, we'll all get together here. I, I missed our last reunion because I was on the road playing music. Good we were Lord. The same class? Yeah, we were all in class we're of 59. We all the same age. Class yes. of 59, we Bedford High School. From Bedford your, School. Your mother was my Sunday school teacher for many years. Yeah. yeah, my dad was the, the, the principal the of the high school. school. And Betty, uh, she and I went to college together over at Baldwin Wallace. So um, we've known... I've known these people, essentially, I, I was going to say all my life, but I still have a few years to go. He was a good dad. I was a lucky guy. I agree. And here's all the, uh, the various mm -hmm. plaques of all of our distinguished alumni. They're in order of as far as when you were inducted. And you were right in front of you, looking at it. Oh, there I am. Oh, well, I'm the I'm the only guy without a tie. I'm the ratty looking guy. <laughs> I thought Halle Berry was in. She is, but she may be down a little bit more. Uh, here's, here's Halle Berry. There she is. Halle Berry. There she graduated. 84. Yeah, she was 25 years too late. <laughs> Wow. It really is, you know, once you see, I mean, you're, you're growing up with your family, you're growing up with your dad, your mom, and they've got these, yeah, these, these hopes, these dreams and whatever, mm -hmm. and getting to see some of my dad's hopes and dreams fulfilled, I cannot begin to tell you. When my dad was a coach at Bedford, he finally got a kid that was six feet tall Gilly Grooms, Gilbert Grooms, and uh, and he was African American, first one that had ever been on his team, and they used to have the basketball letter banquet at Howard Johnson's, and my dad went to set it up, and they set it up, but Gilly was going to have to eat in the kitchen, and my dad said bullshit, and from that point on, the letter banquet was a spaghetti dinner at our house because dad said he was never going to have a student have to go through that. Yeah. And I think he got it from his dad. Uh, he lived in North Jackson, my grandfather, that's where dad grew up. And uh, my granddad had a general store. 
and that was that was during the, it was west. It was between Cleveland and Youngstown, and there was this huge wave of immigrants that came over, and they would not the people in that small town wouldn't have anything to do with them, uh, but my grandfather would trade with them, mm. and uh, to the point where uh, one night the Ku Klux Klan uh, burned a cross on their lawn and then marched into church. Uh, that was a Saturday night, marched into church Sunday morning in their robes. Because at that point, the Klan was very much anti-Catholic. Mm -hmm. And there were all these people from Czechoslovakia and Poland. They'd come over to work at Packard plant and all these car plants. So maybe that's where my dad got it. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that kind of, that kind of inclusion has been, uh, I guess it's in my DNA. This was my sister. We were so close. How old was she? She was 26. The last time I saw her was when I was getting ready to head, head to Colorado. And I came back and she died on Christmas morning. What was the cause of death? She had cancer. Mm -hmm. Mary Jo had lymphoma and my mom worked for Benvenu Laboratories that made cancer drugs and there was nothing they could do. So she didn't make it. But boy, we were close. But I still miss all of them. A lot of memories. No sadness here, it's just pretty overwhelming, actually, joy for all the times that we had and all the people that they affected, as you saw. They're not here. They're they're back in Bedford. They were Bedford, Ohio. The old Blind and Loving Jefferson song, See that My Grave is Kept Clean. Well, there's one kind of paper ball I'll ask you. One kind of paper ball I'll ask you. One kind of favor I'll ask of you. Won't you see that my grave is kept clean? Six white horses following me. Six white horses following me. Six white horses following me. Carry me to my bed ground. I feel blessed because I've been able to make a living in the arts my entire adult life. And I feel blessed because I've been able to operate in, in different disciplines, multi-discipline. Uh, and to me, it's all the same thing. Making stuff is, the creative process is all the same to me. And if, if I'm writing a song, be it words or music or both, or I'm tying a trout fly, or I'm construct a model of a, a building that I saw in Colorado or working on my garden here. To me, it's all the same. You know, there's really no difference. I'm just, I guess, in that, whatever you would call it, creative space. You know, I think it's, I think it's maybe a little divinity sometimes hits you. It's great to, uh, to have a relationship with a partner. I'm not gonna call him a partner. Michael's my brother, you know, we've been together 45 years and known each other, oh, probably closer to 50. So we've known each other a long time. I've known him longer than anybody else that's alive on this planet. So uh, having a partner like Michael uh, means a lot. You know, I, I don't think I would have had the success in all the stuff that I do if I hadn't have had a partner like Michael and a partner like Jan when I was doing television. They, they kind of helped me along. I never did want to be a real rich rock star. You know, I was more about singing about stuff that was happening. I feel like a really lucky guy to be able to have done that. Tom and I have been blessed to be in the right place at the right time, in the right age, and, and, and in a lot of ways. And one of it was uh, we not that we were not that we were by ourselves, but uh, we were 
part of the group of people who sort of invented folk rock, if you will. But I have no regrets at all. Tom and I are good friends. We've been making music going on 50 years now. 50 years and still smoking. <laughs> who would have guessed? Key of C, you remember? <laughs> If it wasn't for acid flashbacks, we'd have no memory at all. I swear to God, you know. <laughs> FM radio was cool. And there was this huge station out of Little Rock, Arkansas, a show called Beaker Street. You all remember that? Yeah, Listen to Beaker yeah, Street. Clyde that. Clifford, the DJ Clyde Clifford. That was what would save us because this was Easy Rider time. You know, we were like littering the Easy Rider movie. We were having to pick and choose where we would stop to get something to eat or buy gas or we got turned away from motels and stuff, you know, because we were hippies, and you didn't see a whole lot of people who glowed in the dark like we did in, in 1969, you know, in Nebraska and Iowa and whatever. But every now and then we would hear this song. We'd be driving at nighttime listening to Beaker Street, and we'd hear this song. It was by a group called Everything is Everything, headed up by a Native American gentleman named Jim Pepper who passed away several years ago. And uh, <clears throat> it's a bad way to get some... Uh, some notoriety, but we got uh, credit in the LA obituaries when he died as to making this song popular. This is the happiest song we know, and tonight, <clears throat> this song really means a lot. Makes me feel glad that I'm not dead. With your tie, tie, kimura, morani, ku, morani, go hey, nay, hey, nay, no. With your tie, tie, kimura, morani, ku, morani, go hey, nay, hey, nay, no.
the spirit spring is bringing around my head. Makes me feel glad that I'm not dead. Ain't no water spirit spring is bringing around my head. Makes me feel glad that I'm not dead. Water spirit spring is bringing around my head. Makes me feel glad that I'm not dead. Water spirit spring is bringing around my head. our pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody. You. See you again sometime. La 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 